Hi, everyone, and welcome to this W2 and TechNet 21 webinar series on life course and integration. This is our second session, and today we'll focus on implementing as integrated health workers vaccine. Uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. We, well, today we're talking about health workers vaccination programs opportunities beyond COVID-19. Um, you can already introduce yourselves in the chat. So don't hesitate. We're really happy to know who's uh, with us today. Talking about the chat, you can also um, uh, let us know if you have any technical issue and I will help you as much as I can. And um, regarding technical issues, and uh, you can also listen to the, the session in French. And I hope you won't have any technical issue. You just need to go to the global uh, that is uh, to, to the globe that is at the bottom of your Zoom window. You click on it and you select the desired language and it's French, Francais. Um, if you have any question during this presentation, please use the Q&A box. It's at the bottom also of your Zoom window and uh, written, I think, as Q&A or Q&R if you have it in French. You can ask your questions at any point and our panelists will uh, answer them at the end of the presentation. Finally, this session is recorded and we'll share with you the links to the video as well as to the slides. I hope you will enjoy this session and I'll give the floor to Shalini. Shalini, c'est à toi. Um, thanks very much. I um, appreciate that. Um, so uh, my name is Shalini Desai. I'm one of the medical officers with the Immunization and Vaccines um, group at the WHO. Uh, presenting alongside me is Stephanie Shendale, who's also on the Life Course and Integration team. Um, so we'll start off with WHO recommendations for vaccination of health workers. Next slide, please. So uh, WHO def defines health workers as individuals who engage in work actions whose primary intent is to improve health. And as you can see from the list that we've provided here um, as examples, this is actually very broad. And the idea is to allow um, for anyone that is, is trying to improve the health of others within the sphere of health. Next uh, slide, please. So the benefits of health worker vaccination include the most obvious, which is direct protection for the health worker, and that would be against occupational exposure, but it also reduces risks to themselves outside of occupational exposures, their families and within their communities. There's also an element of patient safety because they're able to contribute to infection prevention and control of nosocomial infections. Health worker vaccination is also helpful for health system strengthening because it adds resiliency to our health system by protecting the workforce, in particular in the context of outbreaks and epidemics, and we saw this with COVID-19. Finally, it also provides positive health behavior modeling. Vaccinated health workers are more likely to recommend vaccination and advocate to patients and caregivers on immunization issues. Next slide, please. WHO has a number of recommendations um, related to health workers, and these include joint publications, um, for example, the WHO ILO Global Recommendations on Occupational Health and Safety, as well as the Health Worker Safety Charter. We also have a specific table that goes through health worker vaccination recommendations, um, antigen by antigen, and then there are also disease specific global health strategies. So for example, for viral hepatitis, influenza, measles, and rubella. Next slide, please. I'll hand over now to Stephanie. Thanks, Shalini. So uh, we wanted to present this guidance document in case those on the call are not yet aware of it. Uh, it was published last year, um, and it is an implementation guide for vaccination of health workers. So as Shalini just briefly touched on the previous slide, WHO actually has a number of recommended vaccines that all health workers should receive. Uh, of course, there's been a lot of attention on this uh, subgroup as a target population for COVID vaccination over the last couple of years. But there are a number of other important vaccines that are recommended for health workers to protect them in, in their workplace. Um, and so those are measles, 
um, tetanus, meningitis, hepatitis B. Um, there's actually quite a few. And so this guidance document is talking about establishing and strengthening platforms for vaccine of, vaccination of health workers with all recommended vaccines. Um, and it pulls together all the existing recommendations and resources that are already published um, into one place. It's available in English, French, Spanish, and Portuguese. Um, and you can go and check it out at the link there on, um, on the slide. And this guide outlines you know, how a policy and framework for health worker vaccination can be developed, how health worker vaccination can be integrated into existing national occupational health and safety policies and programs, um, as well as the management of these practices in these facilities, um, and how these strategies can be communicated, delivered, and monitored. So also, as touched on briefly by Shalini, there are um, a number of vaccinations that health workers should receive, and these can be grouped um, quite broadly into sort of three buckets. So as I mentioned, there are routine vaccinations, measles, um, hepatitis B. These are childhood vaccinations that ideally all health workers should have received uh, through the routine immunization program um, prior to entering the workforce. There are also an, another bucket of vaccines which are delivered annually or periodically that are recommended for health workers. Um, an example of this is seasonal influenza. Um, and then, of course, there are also emergency or exceptional vaccinations, uh, for example, the Ebola vaccine in, in the context of an outbreak, pandemic influenza, and as we just saw, COVID-19 vaccination. And so the, well, actually, I'll just go back one, one more moment. Um, so th these, the strategies to deliver these vaccinations to health workers and the way that health worker vaccination programs can be designed and implemented will differ depending on which vaccines you're talking about and also who is actually managing and delivering the vaccination program. So in some contexts, we see that vac health worker vaccination is managed and delivered by the uh, essential immunization program, uh, the national immunization program, the EPI. Um, in other contexts, uh, it's managed as part of occupational health and safety uh, delivered by the facilities um, that employ the health workers, and it's part of their um, overall um, occupational health programs. Um, and then we also have uh, contexts where uh, health workers can be vaccinated as part of their training um, in their medical training prior to entering the workforce. And so there are a number of different ways that this can be conducted depending on the context. So the guide that we published last year goes through these various strategies uh, that can be considered when designing a program. Um, and ideally, multiple uh, strategies will be implemented in parallel. So, for example, in pre-service screening and vaccination, um, health workers in training can be offered catch-up vaccination um, as part of their training before they actually enter the workforce. Um, this would be, you know, a, a, this would require screening of vaccination history because ideally a lot of these vaccines would have already been received by the health workers um, through the routine program. And so this course requires some robust data systems to be available in the country so that the health workers are able to locate those records and provide the proof of vaccination um, and so that their records can be updated. Um, this can be built in as part of the uh, training, as I said, but also as part of the hiring or onboarding process um, when health workers are entering new jobs um, and or as part of an ongoing health check, such as an employee health assessment that might happen on a periodic basis. Of course, this requires close collaboration between the immunization programs and the occupational health and safety programs or the ministries that are responsible for managing these labor practices. There should also be a strategy in place to vaccinate current health workers in service. Um, so, of course, this is important when you're talking about annual vaccinations, um, such as seasonal influenza, uh, a system established to be able to reach health workers on a regular basis um, and provide those vaccinations. This is also important um, when catching up health workers with uh, vaccinations that require more than one dose, for example. Um, and so these are often delivered as part of 
the occupational health program you know, through the facilities where the health workers work, but they might also be implemented by the immunization program. In some contexts, you have um, annual influenza campaigns that are managed by the immunization program um, and delivered to the health workers in their workplace or in some other central delivery location. Uh, we also saw this for the COVID vaccination that there were many different models um, developed to reach health workers with this vaccine um, in all the various countries around the world that um, implemented that program last year. Um, and that sort of takes me to the third bucket uh, or category of vaccinations for health workers, which is during emergencies or outbreaks, when this group of individuals needs to be reached often quite quickly um, and are will almost always be one of the highest priority vaccination groups um, in a health break in a health outbreak or emergency, um, because of course they are on the front lines um, and it is imperative that they are protected for both themselves and also to maintain a robust healthy workforce to be able to respond to whatever emergency or outbreak is actually happening. So having that platform for delivery um, is incredibly important for pandemic preparedness as well, because in the event that something happens in the future, already having a platform for vaccine delivery to health workers in place will uh, facilitate uh, a quicker response. And so we saw this again with COVID last year that health programs who were already regularly delivering vaccines to health workers already had a lot of those key systems in place uh, to be able to respond quickly um, to the vaccine, uh, the vaccine for COVID deployment. And there's just one more thing I want to touch on before um, handing it over to, to Margarita um, is just a reminder that when we're talking about health workers uh, in the context of immunization, they're a very unique target group because, of course, some health workers are themselves vaccinators, the ones that are actually delivering delivering vaccines to their patients. Um, and therefore, they're also a very important source of health information and can be really strong vaccine advocates. Um, they're a trusted source of health information. So being able to communicate about the safety and benefits of vaccination to their patients, to their families, to their communities. But they themselves are also recipients of vaccines, uh, which means we need to think about them the same way that we would think about um, any target population that we are attempting to reach with vaccination services, meaning the vaccines have to be available, accessible, affordable, um, and also we have to consider that uh, confidence and demand among health worker population themselves isn't just a given. They're, they're an audience that we're trying to reach with vaccines and therefore um, learning and understanding how they feel as an audience, as a recipient of vaccination, um, about the vaccines, about their confidence, about their, their trust, um, and about their demand uh, is an important part of the vaccine delivery strategy. So there is a lot of research on this. There's been a lot of published studies around improving uptake of vaccines amongst health workers um, in the context of seasonal influenza. In the last couple of years in particular, there's been a lot of published studies around how to increase uptake amongst health workers with the COVID vaccination. And so there is a really strong body of literature there. But of course, doing local behavioral research to understand the specific concerns uh, so that tailored solutions can be um, adopted is, you know, cannot be underestimated. So uh, when designing a health worker vaccination delivery platform, understanding the population you're trying to reach, understanding how they feel uh, about the vaccines and what motivates them to get vaccinated is an important piece of the puzzle. So uh, I think that's it for us. Yes. And with that, I will hand it over to Margarita to take us through the regional presentation. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I am Margarita Caselli. I'm one of the regional immunization advisors at PAHO in Washington, DC, uh, and I am responsible for the projects related to immunization across the life course. The information that I present today is on the policies that our region of the Americas are implementing to ensure vaccination of health workers where we currently stand and where we're going. And before I start, I wanted to acknowledge my colleague Pamela Burgos, who helped me develop these slides, and of course, all the work of our unit in implementing these activities. Uh, next slide, please. 
So in 2021, through the uh, electronic joint reporting form, the EGRF, we implemented a survey of national uh, health worker vaccination policies in 45 member states of the Americas. 21 of those uh, countries responded, and we were able to extract information on communication activities from 14 of those countries, mechanism for introducing a vaccine in a, an emergency context from 12 countries, and systems for monitoring and reporting from 10 countries. And our survey really focused on not only vaccination policies themselves, but uh, a focus uh, for different antigens, whether they are mandatory versus voluntary, integration with other occupational health policy, the finance behind it, how this information, as we said, is monitored, communicated, and evaluated, and then the mechanisms themselves on how to administer these vaccines, especially in an emergency. Uh, 2021, of course, we were in the middle of the pandemic, so this was particularly relevant. Next slide. Uh, I won't go through uh, this table. This is just to give you a sense of the information we were able to collect from those 21 countries. We report here the data for eight of those countries simply because these were the countries with the most mature set of policies to ensure vaccination of health workers. And what you should take away from this table is the different pieces of information we were able to collect, thus forming a very comprehensive overview of the situation of the vaccination program of the vaccination program for health workers in these 21 countries. Next slide. We also highlighted Argentina and Paraguay because we are next slide please. Thank you. Because we are currently implementing case studies in these two countries down to the subnational level. These two countries were uh, great examples of the development and implementation of vaccination policies for health workers. So we want to be able to extract the best practices and lessons learned and offer them as examples to other countries. So we are documenting, uh, again, the implementation of the format of these policies, but also their implementation in considering the national context, the motivation that brought countries to decide to focus on this population the integration with other occupational health policies, and then of course the structure, how are we actually implementing this? You can see the list of topics that we are considering for this case study, uh, but just so you know, this is something that we will be publishing in the next months to provide uh, examples and best practices to other countries. Next slide. Because only 21 countries out of the 45 responded, we are relaunching the survey to 15 other countries for a total of 36 to be able to have a comprehensive overview of the situation in the Americas. So, so this survey is in progress. We are collecting information and we hope to release the complete uh, data set uh, for analysis uh, soon. And this is a work that is being done by our immunization unit at PAHO, along with the health promotion and social determinants unit at PAHO as well. So it is quite comprehensive on all aspects of these policies. Next slide. So here we are entering a, a little bit uh, to show you what has been done to date in terms of vaccination coverage for health workers. And we will present the examples of influenza and COVID-19 vaccination. So let's start with influenza vaccination. Um, the influenza vaccination platforms in the Americas are quite robust and longstanding for both the general population and for health workers, which is why we are able to present data from 2018 and for 2021. 21 is the orange dot, 2018 is the gray dot. So first, the first thing you can see is that we are reporting vaccination coverage rates for select countries. These are the countries who are reporting these data to PAHO, and we are able to report coverage rates which means that we are able uh, to use a denominator uh, to, to estimate the, the, these coverage rates. And we've also seen that there has been a considerable decline in coverage between 2018 and 2021 in most countries, most likely due to uh, the pandemic workforce leaving the, uh, the profession and, and a number of other activities. A few countries have been able to use the response to the pandemic as a way to increase vaccination coverage rates, but they are few compared to the ones that we've, we're seeing here where there has been a decline. Next slide. 
And this is the number of health workers vaccinated against COVID-19 uh, by country and by dose number. So the first thing you notice is that we are no longer reporting coverage rates, we're reporting absolute numbers. And this occurred because once we've taken the denominators that we use for the influenza vaccination program and tried to apply them to the requests we were receiving from countries with regards to vaccine doses for their health workers, there was very little overlap. So this highlights a problem that our region is trying to address as in how to define the number of health workers who require um, vac a vaccination program for themselves throughout for all antigens. Uh, so obviously the denominator for the influenza vaccine program needs to be revised as well. But, there, uh, but for COVID-19, we prefer to present only uh, absolute numbers, again, to underscore this uncertainty that we have with regards to the denominator that we would be using. The other thing that we can glean from this slide is that for most countries, the application of the first dose, the second dose, and the booster dose is quite consistent. Therefore, the dropout rate between doses is quite small for most countries. We've seen some exceptions like Belize or Venezuela, but uh, for the most part, those who start the vaccination series do finish it. Um, and then now there might be additional booster doses beyond the first one, but this is the trend that we are seeing. So uh, once the, pro the series starts, health workers tend to complete it. However, there are some exceptions. And of course, this issue of uh, the lack of a reliable denominator is a concern uh, for the entire project, uh, program for vaccination workers. Next slide. And just to emphasize that through the EGRF, we continuously collect information not only on vaccination against influenza for health workers, but also for hepatitis B and pertussis. And these are data uh, with which we are working with the countries to ensure that all countries fill out these data points, and we include them in our analyses for each year of the EGRF. Next slide. Here I wanted to switch into some additional surveys that we have conducted, first in the Caribbean and then in Latin American countries, where we assess the knowledge and perceptions of health workers towards COVID-19 vaccination specifically. In the Caribbean, we administer this convenient sampling survey in 14 countries. This was six weeks at the beginning of 2021, therefore, Vaccines were just starting to arrive in these Caribbean countries, so what we assessed is very much the intention of receiving a vaccine, as well as their acceptance of the vaccine itself once it became available. What we noticed immediately is that 23% of respondents reported some hesitancy towards COVID-19 vaccines, and 4% intended to refuse the vaccine outright. We noticed there were differences between health category, health worker categories with nurses reporting the highest degree of hesitancy compared to other health professionals, especially physicians, and not reported here, younger persons reported a higher degree of hesitancy compared to their older colleagues. Also, there was a difference in perceptions with regards to the vaccines being offered. So for example, if both Pfizer and say AstraZeneca were being offered at the same times, uh, there was definitely preference towards one vaccine versus another. And there were some differences based also on local, regional, and global events. Um, as you remember, things were moving quite quickly at the beginning of 2021 with the introduction of these vaccines. So as new information became available, uh, these perceptions were, were modified. Only we, off, we obviously have data only for six weeks, but the, even in this short period of time, some changes were um, evident and not always in favor of vaccine uptake. Next slide. We repeated the same survey in 16 Latin American countries, this time at the beginning of 2022. So we are now assessing the uptake of COVID-19 vaccines, no longer the intention to uh, receive a vaccine. And the picture painted in Latin America is very different. First of all, we see that 97% of health worker samples agree that COVID-19 vaccines protects against severe disease. 90% had already completed their vaccination series, which at this point included at least one booster dose, and only 1% reported having received zero doses of vaccines. Now, this is convenient sampling, so obviously those who are completely against the vaccine may not even respond to our survey. This is a bias that we must account for when interpreting these data. However, as you've seen before, the picture 
uh, that is presented here in Latin America is vastly different from that in the Caribbean and uh, therefore implies a much greater acceptance of the vaccines uh, in Latin America. There were still some concerns with regards to the country of vaccine manufacturing, uh, where this vaccine came from did play a part in deciding whether or not to receive vaccination. Concerns over adverse events, uh, a concern we've heard often is the vaccine was developed too quickly, not enough time to assess its um, negative impact, negative effects, um, and hospitalization and mortality rates among vaccinated persons in the sense of the person was vaccinated and still was hospitalized with COVID-19. So even though uptake was much higher among health workers, some doubts remain. Next slide. So for the Caribbean, uh, based on this survey, both on the surveys um, that I presented at the beginning of the presentation and the assessment that we've done in the Caribbean, the Caribbean community, CARICOM, which is a government's association um, for the countries of the Caribbean mandated that member states continue to collaborate with CARFA, which is the Caribbean Public Health Agency, PAHO, and professional uh, associations for the medical professionals to identify strategies and policies to address vaccine hesitancy. And there are a number of interventions that are ongoing educational campaigns, opportunities for health workers to ask their questions and have their uh, concerns addressed, capacity building already at the academic level, meaning already during the um, training, the, the professional training that nurses, uh, receive, nurses and physicians receive uh, to already include specific modules on vaccination involve health workers in the design of vaccination intervention, offer vaccination services at convenient times and places, and use vaccine champions to address concerns. Next slide. At the regional office, PAHU is doing its part. These are the five training courses that we have developed, which are currently available on our virtual campus to address, um, to provide health workers with additional information on vaccines uh, and also vaccines and vaccination practices, vaccination development and approval processes so they can speak, they feel confident about the information and they can advocate in favor of vaccines with their patients. Next slide. So uh, this is my last slide. In terms of remaining gaps and next step, we are implementing the relaunching the survey to these 15 countries that did not respond to the first round, again, to obtain a more comprehensive overview of the situation in the Americas right now. Based on the results from these 36 countries, we will complete a diagnostics on national vaccination policies. Uh, Stephanie had mentioned WHO's implementation guide for the vaccination of health workers. We are adapting this guidelines to the context of the Americas. And from there, from the diagnostics and the, and the guidelines, we will develop a regional operational plans to address the gaps that have been identified through these surveys. We also work quite closely with our TAG, uh, and we will pre present these results to the TAG in order to obtain additional recommendation and, and guidance to the countries on how to close these gaps. And then of course, offer technical support to close these gaps alongside countries. Next slide. So uh, this is the end. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I think we'll take questions at the end of this session. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I think that we can go to the next slide. Okay, my name is Ana Morise. I am a, a, a medical epidemiologist, uh, and, uh, an independent consultant, but also I, I was the vice minister of health in Costa Rica some years ago, and also have been a, a member of the national technical advisory group in my country. So I'm going to share our story uh, about health workers vaccination and our lessons learned. Uh, first, the context in Costa Rica. Our country is a low middle income country. It's located in Central America. Uh, and it is known because uh, even though it is a low middle income country, uh, the country achieved high uh, human development index, as you can see in this sl slide, and also uh, good indicators, good uh, social and health indicators with a life expectancy of 80 years, low infant mortality rate, and the other message in this slide is that the total expenditure on vaccine is financed by the government. We have a, a, a national uh, social security system 
And that's the institution in charge of providing all the vaccines free of charge. Next one. Okay, this is the updated immunization schedule for health workers and students uh, of health related careers in Costa Rica. As you can see here, we have vaccines that were introduced many decades ago, like polio, measles, rubella, uh, but also we have a new, not, not new vaccine, but vaccine has, that have been introducing progressively in our schedule. And the last one of them was COVID vaccines, but we also have hepatitis B, tetanus, uh, uh, a cellular pertussis vaccine, influenza, pneumococcal uh, 13. And my message in this uh, schedule is that in Costa Rica, we have a national immunization law and, and it defines the NITA, the National Technical Advisory Group, as the organization in charge of defining the immunization schedule, but also defining what vaccines should be mandatory and what should be the target population groups that should receive those vaccines. Next one. So uh, to be practical and share with you our story, I'm going to, to present three examples. Next one. The first one is uh, varicella vaccination. So in 1999, to prevent nosocomial varicella transmission, the National Children's Hospital started health work in vaccination. So it was in 1999. And the National Children's Hospital has played a key role in introducing and updating the immunization schedule for her workers. Uh, so the, the Paricel vaccine was introduced first in her workers and then in the national immunization schedule. It was in 2007 that Paricel vaccine was introduced in the national child immunization. So it was several years after that, after her worker vaccination started the, the immunization. Uh, vaccination strategy, not only health workers, but the, the national immunization strategies show that the incidence of hospitalizations, as you can see in these two graphs, and complicated cases of varicella declined in all age groups. So in 2019, vaccination for health workers, not only the National Children's Hospital, but all the public hospitals started varicella vaccination in health workers. And it is also mandatory for students in health-related careers. The next one, please. Uh, the second example is influenza vaccination. It was introduced in 2003, and, and the introduction was based in a cost analysis exercise. Uh, we presented these uh, results to the, to the uh, authority, the health authorities in our country, to show them that the economic benefits increase when vaccinating high risk groups, including health workers, not only the elderly, but also health workers. So based on that exercise and that, that analysis, in 2004, Costa Rica officially introduced a plan of action to vaccinate, uh, to achieve a, an universal coverage of health workers working in the public sector. To reach person in working during our shift, the vaccinators schedule depends on each health facility and uh, because the, the, the goal is to provide vaccines, not only do they, during daytime, but also at night. So they modify the, the, the shift based on, on, on the situation of, of each health facility. And the other thing is that the private sector and organizations are, such as the College of Physicians and Surgeons in Costa Rica, they are actively involved and supported flu vaccination to health workers, and not only health workers, but also their families. The next one, please. The case number three is pertussis vaccination. This is just to share with you some examples. At the end of the year of 2000, again, the National Children's Hospital warned us of an increase in cases of whooping cough in newborns, newborns and infants. They were very small uh, children. And, and the data analysis of that outbreak uh, that the, the National Children's Hospital alerted showed that 90% of the hospitalized children were, were not old enough to complete the three dose schedule of DPT. And most of them, 62% of the cases, of those cases, had history of contact with people with persistent cough. So, based on that, and that analysis in 2007, 
Costa Rica introduced the cocoon strategy, vaccinating close relatives of those of, of children, pregnant women before the child is born, but also health workers. And to do that, we are using the pertussis cellular vaccine. Since then, since 2007, personnel working in maternity wards, newborn care, and other service should be vaccinated. And not only the health workers, but also the students uh, practicing uh, in related careers. The next one, please. Uh, the other example is pre-service screening. How, how do we do pre-service screening of health workers and students of, related, of health related careers? So before starting in hospital training, all students of health related careers, so not only medicine, but also nursing, uh, laboratory related careers and others must provide proof of vaccination. Pre-service screening also applies to new personnel at all levels, not only at the hospital, but also at the, at the primary care system, at the, at the advice, we call them that way. Uh, if, the, if the vaccine register are not available, they must complete the vaccination schedule and sometimes they need to catch up if it requires several doses. If they refuse vaccination, they are included on a list to be reviewed by the director of each facility who can then determine if an exception is warranted. Because as I said before, by law, uh, if that NICTA decides that a vaccine is mandatory, it, it should be that way. So that decision was approved by the NICTA and endorsed by the Ministry of Health and the Social Security System in 2017. This is the, the procedure to vaccinate students in health-related careers and, 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 or, and, and not only students, but also te technical staff. The next one. Uh, we know that vaccine uh, coverage, coverage could be challenging. Monitoring vaccine coverage could be challenging. Uh, in Costa Rica, we have a nominal registry, an electronic nominal registry that is named EDUS. This is, these are some of the, of the screens so that the people can access to this uh, application uh, and it is used to monitor the vaccination in, in the whole country. Uh, vaccines are registered uh, in the EDUS and also all the health workers vaccination that data is included in the, in the EDUS. Uh, how do we uh, estimate the, the target population? So each health facility estimates the target population of health workers and prepares a line list of required vaccines. Not only the, 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 the current avail, uh, mandatory vaccines, but all vaccines. And, and they uh, do that every year. So they, they, they have a, 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 they estimate how many vaccines they will need the next year. The facilities are also in charge of monitoring the uptake based on the number of vaccines administered and also taking into account the denominator that they already estimated. The total number of health workers vaccinated for each of the vaccines are reported monthly to the national system. And in the case of influenza, it's a little bit different because the vaccine coverage is monitored using the estimated population of health workers as a denominator because they are vaccinated every year. The next one. So what have we learned from, from this story? Uh, the first lesson learned is that some vaccines, as an example, varicella, hepatitis B, influenza, uh, were introduced before other target population in health workers. So health workers was like, like the first target group where we uh, started vaccinating with these three and some other vaccines, also pneumococcus vaccine. Uh, this decision makes it feasible to start and progressively increase the access to vaccination to, to more health workers and to other target groups. So it is crucial to find opportunities for updating of health worker vaccination schedule when a new vaccine in the country is, in, is introduced. As the examples that I shared with you, uh, like varicella, pneumococcal, and, and varicella vaccine. Uh, decisions must be based on changes in epidemiological patterns of vaccine preventable diseases and cost effectiveness analysis, as I mentioned before, uh, with influenza vaccine and, and also uh, pertussis vaccine. 
experts, epidemiologists, clinicians, research and academic institutions have been involved in this decision in our country. So uh, a lesson learned is that this kind of uh, colleagues should be involved to support data analysis and also for advocating, uh, to advocate for decision making. The next one. Another lesson learned is that the rationale for hair worker vaccination might be a little bit different to the rational vaccinating children, because in this case, uh, the benefit is not only for the, for the health worker, but also for the patients, because some vaccines, as pneumococcal vaccines or pertussis, uh, reduce the carrier status of the health worker. So vaccinating health worker will protect the patients and also their families. Therefore, the messages should emphasize in all benefits of vaccination, not only the, the individual benefit, and should be tailored depending on the protective mechanism of the vaccines to promote, to promote vaccine acceptance and to promote demand. Monitoring health workers' vaccination can be challenging, as I mentioned before, but there are feasible options in health facilities. So it is important to engage and, and empower each health facility in the process of identifying the health worker who, who are missing any vaccine or, or who needs to, uh, to update the, the vaccine. The, vaccine. Uh, the vaccination starts, but also not only to identify the health workers who needs to be vaccinated, but also preparing the list of health workers who should be vaccinated, implementing vaccination and monitoring coverage. And my last uh, lesson learned is that political government and health workers committed commitments are key contributors to success in order to achieve high coverage of health worker vaccination. Here in this picture, you can see uh, uh, the, the, mini the president of Costa Rica, the minister and the minister of, of the presidency uh, signing a decree to strengthen immunization strategies in Costa Rica. So uh, just to finish this story, this short story, uh, it is important to involve uh, everyone, uh, the national authorities, the technical groups, and of course, the health facility and, and the health workers who are providing uh, health service to our population. Thank you. Um, thank you to all of the panelists um, for your excellent presentations, and I also have to commend everyone for staying on time. Thank you so very much, uh, because that does give us um, opportunity for um, questions and answers. So yeah, thank you so much um, for putting on your cameras. Um, if I can start um, with a question um, in the Q&A, uh, and it's for Margarita. Um, the question that was asked was, from April 2021, um, until after that, um, did you see a change in perception related to vaccine hesitancy among health workers? Thank you for the question. It's, it's one that um, occupies quite a bit of our time. We have not seen any remarkable change in perception towards COVID-19 vaccines. And this is not just among health workers, it's among the, the general population which is exactly why CARICOM mandated all the interventions that I listed to um, promote vaccination, but also uh, encourage vaccination among health workers through multiple strategies. This is ongoing work that we are implementing with our colleagues in the Caribbean, with our sub-regional office for the Caribbean, uh, in terms of communication campaigns, uh, virtual trainings, in-person trainings, uh, again, to address these longstanding questions and and, and make sure that the concerns are, are addressed. Um, it, it's a long road. It must be said that the Caribbean was the part of the Americas that did not have an established platform for influenza vaccination. So the work had to start pretty much from scratch in the Caribbean with regards to vaccination for adults. So uh, there's a long work to go, um, but we continue to focus especially on the Caribbean with this, with this task. Uh, but just to answer the question, no, we have not seen a remarkable change in perception towards the vaccines. Thank you, Margarita. I'll um, hand over to Anna to see if there have been any assessments of this over time in Costa Rica. Um, Anna, I think you might be on mute. 
Thank you. Uh, yeah. Now, my question is, they're asking about cost-benefit assessment. Oh, actually, um, could we start with the, ha have you in Costa Rica found um, vaccine hesitancy has changed um, over the course of the pandemic? So the question that was asked was from April 2021, moving forward, was there, was there a change? Uh, I don't have robust data about, uh, I don't know, to see if uh, there is a change. What we have been seeing is a lot of noise. <laughs> People arguing and talking about that, and most of most of that happened because, as I mentioned, in Costa Rica, vaccination uh, of some of the vaccine health workers is mandatory. So I think the most of the controversy is about if it is good to be a mandatory uh, vaccination or not. But in general, if I look at the vaccine coverage, uh, health workers are vaccinated. I don't know if it is because it's mandatory or not. Uh, but I, I think that uh, I don't have uh, information about an increase in vaccine hesitancy in, in Costa Rica. Uh, the, the, the vaccine coverage in health workers is, is pretty high. Thank you for that. One other question around um, hesitancy um, from Laura. Um, so I'll start with Margarita and then move to Aunt Anna again. Um, are you able to assess hesitation by specialties? So uh, we have done in these uh, surveys that I presented here, um, with regards to the EGRF data, which are our periodic constant uh, source of information on vaccination, there is no stratification by profession. However, on the basis of these data from the surveys that we have administered, we're looking much more closely at the different categories of health workers and making sure that we address the concerns that each group are, are bringing to the table. And of course, um, with regards to the uh, activities that are taking place in the Caribbean, Again, based on the surveys that we've conducted, uh, there is some tailoring, uh, especially at the level of academia. So whether it's nursing training versus physician training to address these concerns in a much more structured way, depending on the, um, on the profession. Thank you, Margarita. Anna, you mentioned that there isn't a lot of hesitancy in Costa Rica, but for the hesitancy that there is, do you have any sense of if it differs by um, specialty? Yes, my sense is not specifically about uh, hesitancy, but what, I, what we have seen is that pediatrician and infectologists are the, the most committed uh, type of specialties. Uh, they have been the, 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 the specialists who have been advocating and supporting data analysis to introduce new vaccines. As I mentioned before, the National Children's Hospital played a, a key role on introducing vaccines in health workers. So uh, this is just a sense, but I think that pediatrician and infectologists are more motivated and also are, they advocate for vaccination. Mm -hmm. And in my experience, uh, um, it's hard to vaccinate a pregnant woman on, and, and the, the, the health facility stop working with pregnant women, maybe because of the, some, I don't know, concerns about the, the, the newborn and the fetus that is growing. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, that's my, my sense in, in, in the case of Costa Rica. Thank you. Um, this next question is for Stephanie. Um, you mentioned a link be between health workers being vaccinated and an increase in their confidence in recommending vaccination to caregivers. Does this hold true when health worker vaccination is mandatory? Uh, I think that will largely depend on the setting. I don't think that's the, the kind of statistic that can hold true globally because, you know, even as Anna, uh, as Anna just touched on that, um, you know, how a lot of vaccinations are mandatory in Costa Rica, but yet acceptance is very high. Um, and we know just from uh, mandatory vaccination in general, not only um, specifically for health workers, that in some contexts, having a mandatory vaccination program is just taken um, as like a grain of salt. And it's part of the way that the program operates in the countries and it's widely accepted and the government recommendations are trusted and, and it works very well. And then we also know that in some 
other contexts such uh, mandates are not so well received and therefore carry with them um, sort of different reactions on, behold, um, on behalf of the population. So uh, it's it's a, it's a tricky subject because it really is very context specific. When I referred to the studies that have been published um, around a correlation that's been seen between vaccinated health workers and their um, confidence with uh, recommending vaccine to their patients. Um, it's it, the, the the ones that I was referring to. Um, there's no specific uh, there's no specific um, info on the the mandatory versus not mandatory. Um, so I don't really know specifically there. But I really do think that it's uh, it's the setting that matters. And I think that the the really important um, point of it all is the. Um, the understanding of the health worker of the value of vaccination, which would lead both them to want to receive vaccination for themselves and also to be able to communicate that on to, to their patients. So that's why the work that is ongoing in Baho, for example, that Margarita touched upon to, um, to educate um, and inform and support health workers to be able to um, better understand the concepts around vaccination themselves. I mean, not all health workers are vaccinators and not all health workers study uh, vaccine and immunology um, as part of their training. And, and that's a potential gap as well. So just improving that understanding around the health worker population to both encourage their own vaccination as well as being able to uh, communicate to their patients um, is going to be uh, the best sort of double-edged strategy in that sense. Maybe some Thanks. of our other yeah. panelists have something to add to that from their own experiences. Uh, let me hand over um, first to um, Anna and then Margarita. Yes, as, 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 as Stephanie is, is mentioning, it's context related and also it can change o over time. Uh, well, in Costa Rica it's mandatory, but the NITA can decide if a vaccine can, can be changed. So for, as an example for COVID vaccination, it was mandatory at one time, and then, as I said, well, the primary series is mandatory, but it's voluntary if you can have the, the I don't know, the number four or five dose of weed vaccination. So uh, the thing is that it's important not to have it uh, mandatory by law, but also to consider the context and also the, the risk, the situation. And, and the other, my other comment is that it's not only to have a vaccine as mandatory, but uh, information sensitization is also crucial. And I think the health workers are a, a key target group to, to support that. And they, they need to be convinced uh, on, on the benefits of vaccination. And I will just add, so if I may, I will just add that we also do not have a specific data to assess uh, mandatory versus voluntary vaccination for health workers and that impact on uptake among the population. I will say that uh, what we have noticed is that in countries with more mature platforms for administering vaccines to adults, specifically health workers, um, vaccination coverage rates in the population are, are higher. Now, this can be a factor of vaccinators um, receiving the vaccine and recommending it to the population or just additional ease of receiving this vaccine in the general population. But it just shows that where the conversation had already started before the pandemic with say influenza or pertussis uh, or hepatitis V, the conversation is much, was much easier to carry through throughout the pandemic with the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, thank you. There's two questions here related to varicella. Mm -hmm. um, the first question is, what is the WHO recommendation for varicella vaccina vaccination for health workers in, low, in lower and low uh, middle income countries? Um, I'll just quickly answer that. Um, what we recommend, if you take a look at our table four, um, where we've compiled all of um, our health worker uh, recommendations by antigen, um, we suggest that countries should um, consider including it within their program, but what Anna Marie, um, sorry, Anna Marie shared with us was that uh, Costa Rica did that. Um, the second question, uh, I wonder if I can go to Anna Marie's for, um, was there a cost benefit analysis done for varicella vaccine for health workers in Costa Rica? Uh, yes, Shalini, we have, a, we, we, we conducted a cost benefit analysis and I don't know, the cost can be very high uh, because nosocomial infection of varicella in, in newborns or immuno, immunosuppressed uh, patients 
can be deadly, but also uh, they need to close uh, some wards and they need to, to provide some other medications. So uh, the, the, the amount of cost was pretty high compared to the to the to the to prevention. So uh, I think we have that those uh, results published. Uh, and, and that was done at the, at the National Hilbert Hospital, considering the, the, the nosocomial outbreaks of varicella and, and also uh, high costs. So we can share that information. Um, thank you. I, I think that would be helpful. Um, the next question um, will go to uh, Margarita and then Anna. Um, it's from Joyce, and she's wondering if there are issues on, on shelf life issues as far as health workers are concerned, and how can we mitigate these? Margarita, can I start with you, and then Anna, I'll go to you next. Sure. By shelf life, I'm assuming the um, approved extension of the shelf life of COVID-19 vaccines, specifically in these last few years, but for all vaccines. We have not heard many concerns from health workers. It's usually a decision that is taken at the national level by the national regulatory agency, whether or not to accept the WHO recommendation that uh, specific vaccines can be, have an extended shelf life. We, what we have seen is that once a national regulatory agency ex adopts this recommendation, then it is uh, implemented throughout the country. It is not always accepted, um, but there is this, so the decision is not really left at the level of healthcare workers, and we have not heard great concerns from the healthcare workers with regards to the shelf life extension because the national regulatory agency has already provided its approval or not. Anna? Uh. Yes, well, in Costa Rica, we extended that the life share of uh, COVID vaccination. And I think that uh, we, I don't know, we had some issues from the population, not health workers, asking if that was correct. So I think uh, by at the end, it was not an issue. I think that an important thing is how you communicate that. Because our the first mention was, you need to vaccinate because the vaccine is going to be expired. And then, no, but we are going to extend the life share. So, it was like a confounding message, but at the end, I think that uh, uh, providing that, that the right information supported by the national uh, regulations and, and organizations in charge of, of that, uh, it was not a, a big issue. Okay, next question is from Anshu, and we're going back to um, vaccine hesitancy. Her question is, any idea how hesitancy proportions among health workers compares to respective background populations? Can I start with Margarita again and then go to Anna? We have not done these, compa these formal comparisons, but again, what we see that is in the Caribbean, um, we have 10 countries in the America, countries and territories in the Americas that retain a vaccination coverage rate against COVID below 40%, and nine of these are in the Caribbean. So we're definitely seeing a correlation between low vaccine acceptance among health workers and low vaccine acceptance overall. It must be said that um, this is always not a one-to-one -one correlation, but it, it's definitely there enough to, to let us know that the Caribbean requires additional attention with regards to uh, vaccine hesitancy and how to address these questions, which are obviously pervasive, not only among healthcare workers, but in the general population. Thank you. I'll go to Anna next. Well, if I, uh, if I, I think on the, on the vaccine coverage in health workers, I would say that, that that vaccine hesitancy hesitancy is higher in the in the in the population compared to that. If I if I I base my answer on 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 vaccine coverage, and and maybe not only in the general population, there are specific groups. I don't know. Uh, it depends on on, on each country that uh, are against the vaccination, but uh, at least in I think in our country they, as I said, they, they make a lot of noise, but. Uh, in general, the, the, the vaccine coverage in a country is high, not only in health workers, but also in the population. Thank you. The last question um, is from our colleagues in Ethiopia, and uh, Stephanie, I'll, I'll have you answer this one, please. Um, in low-income countries like Ethiopia, there's demand for hepatitis B, yellow fever vaccination among health workers, but the vaccine is not available. Is there any support for vaccines for health workers? Uh, yes, and I'll have to go super speedy because I think we're going to lose our connection soon and we oh, have already lost our interpreter. Uh, 
or translator, sorry. Um, but that's really good to know. And um, so WHO uh, is advocating for you know, this type of support to be included in global for global donors. Um, we are part of the Gavi Alliance and we're advocating very strongly for um, inclusion for uh, these vaccines to be part of a package in um, potential future Gavi vaccine portfolios. That's just one example though. And, you know, even if there is global donor support for um, health worker vaccinations, that's only part of the puzzle. Um, of course, there has to be the commitment um, on the part of the national um, programs, whether it's the immunization program, occupational health and safety, um, or more ideally a combination of, of ministries involved to, uh, to recognize the importance of, of protecting their health workforce and, and making those associated investments. So I think like the best thing I can uh, recommend is to continue to advocate in your own context. Um, there's a lot of civil society organizations, um, medical professional associations uh, that can get involved in this kind of advocacy work to, um, to raise the issue so that the um that the governments understand and commit to to including these vaccinations as part of their programs protecting their health workforce um as as part of the pandemic preparedness as well so there's lots of opportunities to get this onto the agenda and get that kind of financial commitment um, i'll just ask uh, my other panelists to add anything else on that point i think you did quite well um, Stephanie, I'll, I'll hand back over to you because I, I think we'll we'll end um, our our time together today. We're a little bit over, but I know that we have more time together uh, in the coming months. Yes, thank you, and thank you to everybody that attended. Um, I just want to remind everybody that this is part of an ongoing webinar series uh, that we'll be holding on a roughly monthly basis um, throughout the rest of the year. And so uh, for everyone who's registered to this one, you'll continue to get the notices for all future sessions that will be um, coming forward. So please continue to share anything you receive around with your networks and encourage um, more signups. The next session that we have planned will be on catch-up vaccination. Uh, it's a very hot topic these days, um, but we also want to remember that um, all catch-up vaccination should be part of an ongoing immunization program strategy uh, to reach anybody who misses vaccination at any point in time. So we're going to talk about that at our next session, which is tentatively scheduled for March 29th. Communication on that will be going out shortly, um, and again with another registration link for those who haven't yet signed up. Um, we have a future session as well in the works on school platforms and using schools as an opportunity to check vaccination status and catch up school aged children. And so that's being planned tentatively for May 10th. Communication will come around shortly about that as well. Uh, but we have lots more topics on, on deck and we hope to see you all at future sessions. Um, and yes, these presentations will be shared and yes, this recording will be shared. Um, so thank you again to all of the panelists today. Thank you for all of your questions and engagement in the chat. Um, and I think with that, we're done unless Alex has anything closing to say. No, you have said everything. So mm -hmm. thank you everyone. And we can close this, uh, this session. Have a very nice rest of the day. Bye. 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 Bye.